How's it going? It's going all right. You like the top of my head? Here, let me move the camera. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Are you searching for a new job? That can be stressful, scary, and time-consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want, and the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole, never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through the interview process just to find out at the very end that the salary, offer, or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Hired is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities in engineering development, design, product management, data science, sales, and marketing. We make your job search faster, focused, and stress-free. Instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best, Hired puts you in control of when and how you connect with compelling new opportunities. After completing one simple application, top employers apply to hire you. And on Hired, you receive personal interview requests and upfront salary information so you can make informed decisions about what opportunities to pursue over a condensed timeline. Hired offers access to more than 4,000 innovative employers, including big brand names like Facebook and smaller emerging startups. The size and type of company you want to connect with is totally up to you. And we help you find new opportunities in 17 major cities in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Open to relocation? Let them know. Your privacy and autonomy in your job search is of utmost importance. And if you sign up today using the show's link, that's Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues, you can get double the normal hiring bonus. That's $600 instead of $300. So go check them out at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Eric Berry. Hey! Dave Kimura. Hey, everybody. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. This week, we have a special guest, and that is Devin Estes. Howdy, everybody. Uh, do you want to give us a brief intro? You've been on the show before, but not for a little while. Yeah, sure. So I'm Devin. Uh, I'm an American living in Berlin. I do Ruby mostly for a living, some Elixir as well. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm a freelancer and uh, and Rubyist and and uh, happy to be on the show. Awesome. Um, um, now, so I got to sorry, you know me. I interject all the time, right? That's right. You live in Berlin. I love uh-huh. Germany. I used to live right on the border of Germany and would actually backpack into Germany to buy groceries at Aldi and then backpack back out. <laughs> How long have you been living there? Uh, a little over two years now. Let me give you let me give you a tip. Don't do what I did and think I want to I want a hobby. Don't go to the, the 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 toy store and buy one of those boats that you have to put together piece by piece, like those ginormous boats. Oh yeah. Because I didn't realize this after I spent two hundred and fifty dollars on it that all of the instructions are in German and you're not going to be able to figure out anything. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. There's there's, the, there's some wisdom right out of the gate. Yeah. No, we just went through filling out all the paperwork for my son that was just born here two months ago, and my. I, I said, if I get through all of this without making a mistake, it'll be nothing short of a miracle. And he came very close to having my name by accident. So, because <laughs> yeah. the person just said name, and I filled out my name, and they were like, no, 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 child's name. So, where are you from I, in the U.S.? Uh, I grew up outside New York City, and then moved in California for a bit. Right cool, nice. Yeah, while we're speaking on Germany, I used to live there in Munich, uh, just outside of Munich for about four years. It's back in the late 90s. And one of my fondest memories of Germany was the Kinder Überraschungs, which is just this little yeah. tiny chocolate ball with the toy mm-hmm. inside. Mm-hmm. Now, you can't really find those here just because of the choking hazards and you know the whatever lawsuits, but uh, those things were so cool when I lived there. Yeah. Are those the uh, the Kinder eggs? Like mm-hmm. in yeah. 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 Kinder Surprise. That's what translates Kinder Surprise? To. Yeah. Kinder Überraschung. Very nice. I used to get those in Italy at the newsstands, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I was I was twenty years old. <laughs> I was like, these are cool. <laughs> you open them up, and you're like, oh, I already got that one. Oh, yeah, we actually bought. Uh, we, I, I'm I'm ashamed to say we smuggled a few of those into the United States. I shouldn't I shouldn't say that publicly, but they're gone now. Evidence is gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're recording this. They're going to come to your house. Uh, all right. Can you please cut that out? Like just <laughs> you know, two minutes thirty seven seconds or two minutes forty five. Yeah. Anyway, so we're we're on to talk about methods versus functions, and you know you gave us some links. I went and listened to an episode of the Bike Shed podcast. We'll put that in the show notes. Um, and you're also going to be speaking about it at Ruby Dev Summit. Um, but do you want to kind of give us 
the the two minute elevator pitch on you know what we're talking about here and what some of the benefits are? Sure. Uh, so, um, in short, there are functions in Ruby, whether we we see them as such or not, they're there. The prime example that I see is a block. So a block is the only thing in Ruby that actually isn't an object. When you look at how it's implemented in C Ruby, um, I actually learned that when I read um, uh, Ruby under microscope, Pat Shaughnessy's book, which is great. Mm-hmm. But that's when that realization first hit me that a block is something special, it's something other than an object. It is, in fact, it's a closure, which is a function, uh, and that comes from Lisp. It's a very old, old concept, but um, Matt's uh, has said many times that he was sort of inspired by Lisp in wanting to have real closures in the language, and that's what a block is. Um, and blocks are really, really powerful. Um, you know, if you've ever used an enumerable, then you've used a block, and and a block itself is an anonymous function. So um, the flexibility and the the uh, ease of use of blocks and functions sort of led me to think about other things that are also functions, like uh, lambdas and procs. Uh, those are also functions, but they're funny because they're objects that are functions. Uh, they're objects that behave like functions. And when you look at other places in Ruby, you can see objects or methods that behave like functions. And to me, a function is sort of like one of the, the pinnacles of object-oriented design. If, if, if you look at it, because one of the great things of object-oriented design um, is looking for small interchangeable objects that you can compose together and pass around that can do stuff for you. You can build up behavior with these small interchangeable objects. And functions are very, very small. They only do one thing. So they satisfy the single responsibility principle really well. Um, but they're also really easy to replace because they have such a small public API, being that they only do one thing. Uh, so that is sort of what has led me to looking at other ways that you can design for functions and use functions in Ruby uh, more um, uh, with more intent rather than doing it accidentally. Because I see a lot of people that sort of do it accidentally and they, they stumble into something and say like, oh, look, I, I found this great thing. I said, oh, yeah, that's a function. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of the gist of, of the talk that I'm going to be giving at Ruby DevConf um, and what we're going to talk a little bit more about today. But, yeah, functions, functions exist in Ruby, and I, I think they're actually a, one of the great parts of the language is the ability to use functions easily. and to, uh, we, have, we have great support for functions, and um, it, it works in so many contexts from you know, simple little CLIs to big Rails apps. There are great places to use functions. So I thought since we were in an object-oriented land that we hated functions. So do they well, play nicely that's together? The thing. They do. Well, it depends on what you, uh, how far down object-oriented land you want to take it. So the idea behind object orientation is you bundle state and behavior together. But what happens, for example, if you have two pieces of state, like you have a post and a user, and you want to add a user to a post. Should that method go on the user ob- uh, class or the post class? Because it's the interaction of two objects. Um, it could, in theory, go on either or both. But I think in cases where you're dealing with the interaction between separate objects, and specifically when you're not dealing with changing the internal state of certain objects, functions are a great way to represent mm-hmm. that behavior. Um, there are often times where keeping behavior and state together makes total sense. Like if you have a user who has an address and you want to get their full address, you can have a full address method that you can operate on that user's internal state to, to return you. But um, there are often times, especially in larger applications, where you start having um, large business processes, things like that, that you can't put on an object. You know, it really is a big thing. It's like application.start is a little wild. You know, an application object is going to be crazy. Uh, it would be so big and so unwieldy that it would, wouldn't make sense to, you know, keep passing an application or object around. Uh, but if you can break that down into a function that takes a couple of collaborators, you then can, uh, edit and change that function much easier as needed as, as your business requirements change over the course of your application's lifetime. 
So to use your example, I mean, when would you, I need to back up just a minute because I'm, I'm fairly familiar with functional programming. I'm fairly familiar with mm -hmm. object oriented programming and I've been around for a while, done a lot of this with JavaScript and other languages. Um, I did a whole bunch of scheme a while back, um, just for fun. And you know, it's, it's powerful. And, you know, we start talking about pure functions and side effects and all that stuff. And I'm not going to dive into that yet, but, um, when do you want to go for a function then versus, you know, having a method on a user or a post or something like that? Because it seems like, you know, maybe I, cause, cause I wind up duplicating it a lot of times, right? It's like mm -hmm. add a user to this post or add a post to this user mm -hmm. or create a post that belongs to this user. And so I have like five or six different ways of doing this and they all essentially do the same thing. So do I need a post adder thingy function or, you know, is that kind of overkill for something that's that simple? For something that's that simple, especially since that behavior is going to be given to you by your ORM, most likely you don't need to go that route. You don't need a new function for right. that. But um, one of the examples that I like to use is, for example, controller actions are great to extract out into a function, especially if you have complicated uh, authorization logic or authentication logic in your controller actions. That's a great way to split that out into a function to, uh, you can then uh, compose different things together into um, larger groups rather than having, you know, uh, I've seen controllers with like three or four levels of inheritance so that they can build up all of this functionality into one huge object. <laughs> and that object becomes really difficult to test. It has a lot of internal state. That state can change. And like, I, I've never known how you can actually like pull up a Rails console and instantiate a new instance of a controller object, uh, a, a controller class. You know, um, there's so much that goes into that that happens behind the scenes that for me, it makes sense to just get out of that world as fast as possible because it's very complicated and to try and to get into a world that I control and I can do that really well with a function. Um, funny enough, if you look at uh, Hanami, their controllers are sort of modeled like that. You have one object per action. Um, and I, I think that's a really great pattern, actually. Um, but I, I, when I'm working on Rails applications, I'd love to just sort of stick in a, a function in there that takes parameters, maybe a current user, any other information that that function might need to get its job done. And then you can pass that stuff off, that state off to, for example, a function that will update your posts for you. And then that, that's a great start for me. But the, the sort of heuristic that I use is if it's not abundantly clear what class a method should go in, I put it in a function until it is abundantly clear because it's so easy to change and, and uh, edit functions. And it's much harder to, um, when we start adding more methods to a class's public API, it gets much harder to change because you're using it in many different places. Uh, so it's a lot easier to change a function than it is to change a large class. So I try and avoid... Um, putting something on a class unless it's like really obvious it, it's abundantly clear to me and i think it would be abundantly clear to anyone else coming into this code later that this method belongs on this class for this reason like there should be no question about it um, i see a lot of times in rails applications where stuff is just sort of chucked in a model somewhere because nobody thinks of a better place for it to go because no one is thinking of writing some other object that can handle that uh, that behavior or, or, or model that, that process. So, um, that leads to really big overblown, uh, applications, uh, and big, big models that become increasingly difficult to test and, and frequently are under tested because when it becomes difficult to write tests, people stop doing it. So, uh, that's one of the other things I love about functions is because they're so small, they're frequently really easy to test. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my sort of heuristic is, uh, it should sort of jump out to you as to where a, fun uh, a method should go on a class or, and if it doesn't jump out to you and it's not obvious, then a function might be a great place for that to go. Now I've been before I, I went through this, uh, Ruby moment of denial for about two years and I went to uh, groovy and grails, which I love. One of the things that I love about, uh, grails framework, uh, and, and how they solve this problem is service objects. And they have they have services there, um, and it it really was if you are dealing directly with a specific uh, domain class or model, um, you would write it on 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 that 
on that class. But if you are dealing with any type of interaction where it's cross between multiple different models, then it then you would create the service class, this the service object. And I know that I mean, man, it's still being talked about all the time. And there's the debate on uh, whether service objects are are making sense, whether um, it, what the new Rails concerns, if that is what um, uh, it, it addresses it, and it, it does to a point. Now, I, I'm 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 in your camp, man. I agree that um, having these functional is that what it is? Item potent. Item potency. Um, so, like, if it's run many many times, right? Same, but yeah. it so doesn't change. These type of, yes, those, these type of classes are 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 super easy to deal with. Um, but let me let me let me put it back at you and say if. If uh, so many, so I've worked at two, I have two, two companies, right. That I've worked. I'm not going to say who they are. One company that I worked at, um, had, and they're very popular company. Uh, they had a, a model, um, the user model had over 3,500 lines, right. It was oh. a monster, oh. a monster, oh God. monster. And it was, and, and, I and weep whenever, for you. They, whenever people had to work on the, on the legacy <laughs> app, on the actual core application of that company, everybody's like, ah, you know, so they all wanted to work on the new fun stuff, but <laughs> nobody wanted to get in and mess with these 3,000 line models. And then the other company that, that I did some contract work for, they they had the opposite where everything was broken out into like this tight service. And I felt like every single time I did any changes, it was like I was taking the bar exam every time because it felt like they were, they were so strict on, on patterns and making sure that everything was extracted out into these, these services. So I found somewhere in between is, is ideal for me, but uh, let me ask you this. If one does do, do service objects address what you're talking about? Does that solve your issue? And two, if so, why hasn't it been widely adopted yet? So there are a lot of different ways to write functions in Ruby, and one of them is something called the method object. So um, it's a design pattern that's been out there that is basically an object that only has one public method, which um, I like to just use call because that's what Ruby uses for the other function like objects for procs and lambdas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the same idea. Uh, I mean, people can call them service objects, you can call them functions, you can call them you know plain old Ruby objects, but really they're they're just classes or they're instances of classes and they respond to a single method and that's a function. If uh, that's, I, I take that definition from Ruby in that a proc or a Lambda is that same thing. It's an instance of a class that responds to a single method and it, it doesn't have any internal state. It doesn't have uh, uh, anything like that. You know, you can't, uh, you can't instantiate an instance of the block class. Um, and, uh, that to me is a great way to go. And you can use method objects, you can use module functions, you can use uh, procs or lambdas, you can use blocks. Uh, they all can function in the same way and that makes them easily interchangeable and that's one of the great reasons to use them is because they're so easy to interchange and to compose. Um, and I, you know, I bet with that 3,500 line user model, I bet there were a lot of methods on there that weren't even using any of the internal state of the user class or the instance of that class. I bet there were a lot of them just doing other stuff. And that's one of the things that I see um, is when people don't know where a method should go, they just put it somewhere rather than putting it in a new class and having it live on its own. And that's okay in Ruby, having a class that has a single responsibility, a single public method. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, it, it goes contrary to some of the Rails doctrine, and that's okay. And I've, I've also seen applications, like you mentioned, where this idea gets taken to an extreme. Um, and the, I think that's part of the reason that it hasn't caught on as much so far uh, is because people that go this route go really hard in this route. And yeah. when you go yeah, really definitely. hard in that route, you pay prices because one of the best things about the Rails community and about the Ruby community is the, the maturity and the depth of the ecosystem. And when you start deviating too far from the accepted norms, you lose a lot of that. Um, that. That's why it would be too hard to to go really far in that 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 way. Um, but where I've seen success in this is when people use it sparingly. People use it for applications for parts of business logic that are extremely complicated that they want to just extract into one thing because it's an ex a complicated piece of logic, and it's easier to test a complicated piece of logic in isolation rather than having it rather than having it live on something that's already big. Uh, being able for you know for me, 
if I have a class that's longer than 100 lines of code, I'm going to have a hard time understanding it, and I'm going to have an even harder time testing it. You know, for me, a great a great length of a class is like 50 to 75 lines of code. That that encapsulates about as much as I can probably keep in my head at one time in terms of complicated logic, assuming it's complicated, assuming there's a lot of stuff going on there and it's not just, you know, a, a 50 line hash or something. But um, yeah, it, it makes it easier to understand the parts with the cost of understanding the whole. Um, and that, I think, is a worthwhile trade off especially in larger applications, because you're not going to, in huge applications, you know, if you're working on GitHub, there are very few po people that know how every part of that application works, but there are a lot of people that need to know how individual parts work. And that is what most people are doing most of the time. You're working on one small subsection of your application, and it should be easy for you to understand that section of your application to get your job done. You shouldn't need to understand the entire application in order to get anything done. So that's... Um, that's the trade-off that you're making. There are some things where you do need to understand the entire application. If you're doing, you know, big design work or, or changing some some big part of your application, you know, changing authentication logic or something, um, that might require you to have a knowledge of how the rest of the system works. But if you can keep all of these pieces um, as separate and decoupled as possible, then it's really easy to change them. And that's another one of the good things about functions is you can compose them together. You can pass in these objects as arguments to other objects. And uh, you can, using that rather than using inheritance or module inclusion, you can build up your application in a really, um, uh, a really robust and especially a, a very encapsulated way. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of people that say, you know, each one of these classes is only 75 lines of code long, but like there's eight an eight class inheritance hierarchy. So really the, the class at the bottom has the sum total of, you know, 500 lines of behavior, even if each class is still uh, only 75 lines of code long. Whereas with functions, you don't need to rely on inheritance or module inclusion nearly as much because you're encapsulating behavior really well. So that's one of the other great things. I, I think it, it leads you towards really good design decision trying to rely more on composition rather than inheritance and to compose together uh, bits of logic. Um, but yeah, it can definitely get taken to an extreme and then you pay the price of not being able to use the rest of the ecosystem out there. Although there are more parts of the ecosystem that are playing in this sandbox uh, that are coming along all the time. There's more and more people are seeing some, some real value in this, especially for uh, larger applications. So how do how do you how do you place these uh, functions in your your Rails apps, right? So if you're using this in Rails, do you add them in lib? Do you package them separately? Do you put them in the app folder? And how do you how do you uh, how do you deal with those in your Rails apps? Usually app services. Um, okay. So app services, and then break down from there. Um, but. Uh, it's not always uh, entire classes. Like I, I really love the block. I think it's a, a criminally underused feature for a lot of people, especially in Rails applications, um, because it allows you to, instead of, you know, I, I frequently will use blocks to replace conditionals because often that's what you want. If it has some behavior, do this. If it has some behavior, do that. Rather than checking that behavior, you can just pass a block in each instance where you're calling that method. That's that's really uh, function composition is what we're doing there. You know, uh, passing a block to a function is a higher order function in in Ruby, so uh, that's a great place to use it. But it uh, yeah, it doesn't have to always be objects. It can be blocks. It can be lambdas and stuff that I'll use. Um, I I will even use uh, one of the things I like to use a lot are module functions because it to me that's really clear. Uh, that this is a thing that is not going to be instantiated. It's just a function. And that's already built into to Ruby. The, the module function method is built into Ruby. So uh, it's there to use. We might as well use it. Love it. Yeah, I think when you start getting into classes that are 3,500 lines or whatever, like especially if it's a, a model class, I would start breaking that out. You know, Because I've worked with several applications where the model is just ridiculously large. You know, the number of associations that are 
working on there, uh, doing the different kind of validations. And I'll usually just extract those out into its own concern. Uh, you know, have an associations concern for maybe a user's model, have an association concern or for um, validations. And it would just be its own module that gets included into the main class just to keep things broken out. Because, you know, when you start talking about much larger applications, you're also going to start running into many more merge conflicts as you have more people working on it. And I've been in some really bad situations where we had to basically cherry pick through to see what the final result needs to be. So I think having a happy medium between uh, segregation of the code, whether it is through uh, having separate functions to handle the responsibility or just breaking out the logic into smaller files, uh, can be really important when you have multiple people touching the same area of code. One thing that I'm seeing a lot with this, though, is that you know people get... Uh, the thing that I always hear about with this is single responsibility uh, principle with solid development. And so a lot of folks are like, okay, well, I'm just going to break this job out. And it turns out there's only one class that uses it. And so I don't really see what difference it makes, whether it's in the class or not, even if it makes the class just a little bit longer. Um, but typically, you know, if there's some kind of work that is shared across classes, or if there's um, some level of you know, just ev everything in here kind of moves together. Um, that to me is single responsibility principle. And so I can move all of that aside as kind of a, a module or a group of methods or a set of functionality that, you know, all kind of uh, intermingle and interdepend. Or, you know, if, if I'm modifying this, I'm probably going to modify these things too. Um, in fact, I heard a talk by Uncle Bob where he actually talked about that. And he said single responsibility is where you know, it, it's a group of meth, uh, a group of functionality that is likely to be modified at the same time. And so to me, what it says is if I have a different level of abstraction, so, you know, kind of the, the high level, you know, I need to do this job, then that's that job, then that job, then that job, you know, that can kind of be on the class. And then, yeah, if I have some shared logic or something like that, that's at a different level, you know, so then it's kind of in the nuts and bolts of talking to the database or, you know, compiling JavaScript or, you know, building a payload or something like that. Then I can move those kinds of things out um, and make those into the functions. And then even if I am only using them once, at least then I, I kind of know what I'm looking at. But I think a lot of people, they, they just see a big class and they just take a chunk of methods that kind of all look the same and move them off into a, a module that they include then mm -hmm. on their class. And it just, it, it's like, okay, now I have my class that imports my junk drawer module and, you know, it moved all this stuff out so I don't have a big long list of methods, but in the end it really didn't solve any problems. It just made it so I had to go look at two files to figure out what was going on. And so, you know, I, I think there is some deliberate um, methodology to this where you look at things and you say, these, all of these things kind of move as one or all of these things are part of the same set of functionality for this class. And so that those are the things that I'm going to move off into uh, a function um, module, or you know, I'm going to encapsulate this into a Lambda or a proc or something like that that I can pull in later. Yeah, I mean, to me, there are a couple really, like there's one real clear indicator of where a function might be great, which is if you're not using any of the internal state of the class that a method is defined on. And I see that with more frequent frequency than I, I probably should. But if you're not using any of the internal state of the instance of the class that you're defined on, then there's no need for it to be there. It can go somewhere else. And if it can go somewhere else, maybe it should. Um, that's one of the markers that I, I look for in looking for functions. And I, it's funny, but you know, you see it, but that's, that's a great rule, I think, is if you're not using any of the internal state, you know, if you're not using any uh, instance variables on that function, then or on that, that class, then maybe that thing, that method should be a function instead. One other thing that, that comes to mind with this is, let's say you have different classes of users. So maybe instead of assigning roles to users, you have admin users and users. But 
when you compose like their first name or, you know, some kind of output to the screen, you're composing it all in the same way. So rather than use inheritance, you could also pull that out into a function. And so then instead mm -hmm. of using at first name and at last name, it just takes two arguments. And so even though it is using internal state, I can see that also as a, a place where you may look at it and say, you know what, I've got some shared functionality here. And it would take the same two arguments and it would just pull it mm -hmm. together that way. Well, yeah, I, the one of the other sources, the things that I like to point out as functions are uh, like all the, I think it's action view helpers, like all the like numbered currency and stuff. All of those are essentially functions. They take in data, they spit out data. Um, and now they, they do it by including that in the global view uh, scope, which I don't like to do. I like to explicitly call the module and then the function so that I know where exactly it's coming from mm -hmm. rather than having to, you know, try and find it somewhere in a module. But uh, those are all just functions. And that's a great example of good use of functions, uh, things like that, where you're just, you know, um, one of the other great examples of functions in the Ruby standard library, well, no, in Ruby core is in the kernel module. So there are actually things called conversion functions that you can use with like a capital I integer. Mm -hmm. And that is a function. Um, now, technically, it's a method on, on kernel or on object because a kernels included an object, but you can call it as kernel dot capital I integer and pass in, you know, string 42 and it will give you 42. And that's a conversion function. That's another great example of a function that just takes in data and spits out data. It doesn't deal with any of the internal state of the receiver of the method call. This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 40 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash rubyrogues. So one thing you mentioned, and I, I don't know if this would be an issue or not, so maybe you can just clarify this point for me, is that you tend to, at least in your Rails apps, and I can see doing this in, you know, in Sinatra or just in general in your applications, right? You know, you have lib services instead of app services. Mm -hmm how do you keep that from becoming a junk drawer, right? Because you're essentially putting all of your utility functions in there. So, you know, how, how do you, know, how do you get hundreds of files in there in a reasonably complicated application? How does that not become hard to manage? Or is it generally that you're referencing it in a model or some other class? And so you kind of know where to look when you need to change something. So the only way I have found to keep it from being hard to manage is to change frequently. Because as you uh, learn more about the domain of the application that you're working on and you learn more about what actually you're modeling, the more your understanding of how it should be modeled is going to change. And if something needs to be renamed, you can rename it um, and you can move stuff around. You know, if you know you start off and you just have users, but later on you need to have admin users and you have some uh, functions that were, you know, user functions. Uh, one of the other great things about functions is you can pretty easily search, search and replace if you're using the fully qualified name all the time. Um, you, you aren't looking for instances of that all the time. That's another reason I like to use the, the fully qualified name when I use functions. So I will actually type the, the module and then dot whatever I'm calling. Or I'll type, uh, if I use um, method objects, I will still, one of the things I like to do is define call on the class itself. So self define self dot call. And then I can instantiate instance of that class privately to do whatever I need to do. If it's really complicated and I want to have a slightly more object oriented standard approach to that class. Um, but I'll still define self dot call. And then it basically passes those arguments onto an instance so that you can spin up an instance, give it some instance behavior, uh, instance state, and then operate on that state in the execution of that function. And then that instance is all private and goes away and is never exposed. That's all implementation detail. 
But that's interesting. So essentially what you're saying is that you set up dot call and dot call calls dot new with the new information that it needed. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So that's something I like to do because um I do that I all find, the time. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> yeah. Uh I, I think it, it it's a great middle ground because a lot of people are you know, you, you look at a class like that and you can still see how it works. You still know how it works. It's not too complicated. You're not necessarily passing around a ton of arguments. It can still give you a lot of the benefits, but still keeping the implementation really well encapsulated. So you're not leaking anything. So one other thing that I've heard a bit about is value objects. And I've used these as well, you know, where you Mm -hmm. essentially have, um, you know, like telephone number class that doesn't have an active record, you know, database connection. It just allows you to nicely operate on, you know, a telephone number string. And so then you can Mm -hmm. pull the area code off or the country code off or this or that or the other. And so when you call dot new, you know, you have in your initialization method that it sets up a telephone object so that you can get that out of there and, and, you know, Mm -hmm. make those nice calls. So how much of that do you want to do with a value object? And when is it appropriate to move some of this off to a function? Let me see if I get you right. So the the value objects as still having some internal state or yeah, generally they do, but it's generally just say the string that was stored in Active Record or yeah. something. So conceivably, you could have a you know like an area code uh, grabber. I, I don't know what you would call yeah, an it. area code an area code method on on. So like if you're defining a struct that takes a telephone number, you have an area code method on that struct. Right, but you could also but, yeah. then set up a function you know a functional mm-hmm. method that or a functional module that also does the same thing right it's it's you know area code you getter could, dot whatever yeah so i i personally don't use a lot of value objects i just use uh regular ruby objects to to maintain state but the benefit you get with value objects is you get naming you get to name another thing so if you mm-hmm. do have some sort of uh important concept in your code that needs a name and you're just using a hash for that, sometimes it's better to give that a name. Um, and that can be really helpful in communicating the intent of your code. Um, in, in honesty, I probably don't do it as much as I should because it takes extra time and naming things is hard, but there's a lot of benefit to naming things. Um, and, and people, can frequently suffer from primitive obsession where you're just trying to, you know, pass around hashes all the time rather than giving that hash a name. You know, if you find that you're using the same variable to reference that hash in, in many different places and you're passing that hash around, maybe that hash should be a thing, like parameters, for example. Parameters, instead of just being a hash, is an instant, in, in Rails, parameters is an, uh, it's an instance of uh, action controller parameters which makes sense. And there's a little bit of behavior on there instead of it just being a hash. But um, I think in that case, the behavior, because it's pretty important, it's pretty importantly coupled to the internal state of that object of what parameters are included or or not included, which are safe Mm -hmm. and which are not safe. um, I think that's a great instance of where you do want to keep behavior and state together because it's so tightly coupled to that specific uh, behavior in uh, that specific data in your domain. When it's more general, when it's, uh, you know, making an association between a user and post, whether that user is an admin user or a regular user or a super user, and whether that post is published or not published, then that can be, uh, that can maybe be something that's pulled out into a function. But action controller parameters, I think, is a great instance of a value object. I would consider that a value object and uh, a great instance of, um, uh, of naming a concept. Um, and the value you can get from naming that concept, I think. Um, and there are people out there that use value objects and say a value object shouldn't have any methods on it other than attribute accessors and attribute setters, getters mm-hmm. and setters. Uh, like a, a, a value object should only represent a value. Like, um, Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, there, there are people, like there's a, a values gem that does that, I think. Um, that I've seen used before and they create immutable value objects that are basically just immutable structures which uh, only hold data. They don't have any behavior. Um, I'm not as big a fan of that because I think it takes the f- the functional idea. I think there's a difference between functional and functions, which is funny, but it takes the functional approach a little bit too far that I think Ruby is naturally suited for. Um, Ruby 
I think is great in being a multi-paradigm language. It's it's a great object-oriented language with some some of the best sprinkles of of functional programming with with closures and with with blocks and and some of the functional stuff that's built in to Ruby like conversion functions. Uh, those are those are great little sprinkles of functional behavior. But that's a, one of the things I make I think makes Ruby so powerful is it's not it's not small talk and it's not it's not a scheme. It's, it's a, a mix of the two that takes the best from both. Um, and I think that's a, you're seeing that more and more in newer and more mature languages. You're seeing people that are straddling the boundaries of, of object orientation and, and functional programming that have a little bit from each taking the best from multiple languages. Um, you know, I think it's funny that, uh, sort of my, my other language is Elixir, and, and there are a lot of ways that you can look at that as a functional language, but you can see a lot of object orientation in that as well. Um, and uh, I, I still think that's one of the great things about Elixir, and one of the great things about Ruby is that it, it merges those two, but in a, a, a coherent way. I've never in Ruby thought that I was confused or I was switching between two different paradigms. It always just sort of felt like one thing to me. Using a block doesn't feel like you're moving from object-oriented land to functional land. It mm-hmm. just feels like you're using Ruby, and we can we can dive even further down into that rabbit hole. And I think there's there's some more good stuff there. I, I think we could go a little bit farther in that that direction, and and before we start hitting uh, hitting some roadblocks. So, are there any libraries out there that you're aware of, or frameworks, or anything that you can that kind of nudge you in the right direction as far as doing this? Yeah, so that was sort of what I spoke about last time I was on the show, um, is a lot of people, I think specifically in Europe, I don't know why, but um, over here in Europe, there are a lot of people that are exploring this a little bit more. Um, so Hanami, as I already mentioned, um, has some more of this built into it. Um, a big part of that is because it uses ROM for persistence by default, and ROM, uh, Ruby Object Mapper, is much, much more uh, functionally inspired um, than certainly uh, Active Record. Um, probably even more than, than SQL too. And then uh, there's a suite of libraries called dry RB and those are very, very, very functional. Um, those are, I think, pushing the boundaries of, of Ruby as a functional language and relying on functions. Um, that sort of stuff I think is really important to explore. And I think it's really interesting. I don't use much of the dry RB stuff because for me, I think it goes a little bit too far, but there are some great things that you can take from that. Like the dry validation, I actually think is great uh, for doing validations because validation can be pretty complicated, and, but that's something that's really well modeled as a function. So yeah, I'm really happy there are people like Piotr that are sort of exploring that element of Ruby. And there are, there are people that are doing more stuff working on immutability because, uh, you know, I don't focus so much on immutability. I think immutability is fine, but there are people that are pushing immutability a little bit down the road. Like there's a great adamantium gem to actually make immutable stuff. Yeah, those are the, the, the biggest ones that I know of. I'm sure there are more. Um, I, they're, they're funny enough, there's also a wonderful talk by Jim Wyrick that's old, but where he builds the Y Combinator just with lambdas in Ruby. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was an old keynote. Uh, oh, uh, I forget what it's called, but I remember seeing it. And the first time I saw it, I had no clue what was going on. It was like three or four years ago. I had no idea what he was doing, but I just thought it was so cool. And he's so good. At, he was so good at getting talks. Yeah, that's it. Why not? From yep. 2012. But it's a great talk and it shows sort of the power of taking it too far. <laughs> you know, he sort of makes the point this is what I'm about to do is a terrible idea and you won't be able to read it but I am going to do something really cool and he does uh, so yeah I mean you could potentially model that in a way other than just using straight lambdas but uh, it, it is a really cool talk that's awesome I did I did have a question for you and I don't know if you're able to talk about it or what <laughs> but the, the company that you work for is Education Superhighway right? yeah can you talk a little bit about that? Because I was looking at the website, and I think it's phenomenal what you guys are doing. Yeah, so um, three years ago, their recruiter contacted me, and I had no idea why they were contacting me because I thought they were like a networking company. Uh, like, like I know very little about wiring together uh, like, like large uh, Wi-Fi networks. Um, but it turns out, and I, I didn't even know it was a problem 
until they contacted me. But it turns out that in America, um, we're not very good at getting the internet into schools. We're doing much better now, three years on, but uh, back in 2014, uh, was it 2014? Yeah, so back in 2014, we weren't so good at it. Um, and so the, the goal of the company is to basically get every school district in America prepared for digital learning um, so that kids in school can use Khan Academy. They can use all of the great tools that are on online now for them. Uh, they can use them in school. Uh, for a lot of kids, especially in rural places, this might be the, their best place for connectivity. They may not have internet at home or they might have very slow internet at home. So getting internet into schools and to a lesser extent libraries is a really important thing. Um, and we've, we've already done a whole lot towards getting most schools in the U.S. meeting the government mandated uh, deadline or minimum. Uh, well, I shouldn't say mandated, but recommended minimum of uh, 100k per student um, but there are still uh, some schools that don't have that and what we're really trying to do now is uh, by 2020 get 99 percent of schools in the u.s connected to some sort of fiber because that means they will have basically scalable access to however much bandwidth they're going to need for the foreseeable future uh, and that's a lot harder because you know we're trying to undergo dozens of essentially fiber builds. Uh, we're working with school districts and states to try and just put a lot of fiber in the ground and it's a big country and uh, that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So uh, that's mostly mostly what I work on is internal tools to help our team do their job faster and better, help them scale their work a little bit better. And uh, Yeah, it's a, it's a great organization and I'm, I'm proud to have, have helped so far and looking forward to seeing it through. You know, the the, when I first joined, they said, we're only going to be around until 2017. And then they said, well, now we're going to be around until 2020 because we have more work to do. Like it, it, it's a solvable problem. And, and eventually the company will go away when the problem is solved. But um, uh, it was great to sign on to something that is a solvable problem that I can make real impact on. And, uh, and yeah, they've been, they've been a great, uh, great partner for me and working, working really well. Uh, even when I moved to Germany, they, they managed to work, work consulting agreement out. So, uh, yeah, it's been great. That's cool. Yep. Man, I remember high school where Wikipedia was a valid source site. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. My college professors, they were all like, you can't cite Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. This is no, back I mean, in the... Netscape Navigator days. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, my son's homeschooled, so if you could get fiber to his classroom, that would be awesome. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, funny enough, Utah is one of the better states. They're, they've been doing a great job for taking care of their, their schools. Arkansas, actually, was, I think, they were one of the first states that partnered with us, and they've, they've been doing a great job, too. And uh, I think we have, uh, we're working with, I think, almost all of the states in the U.S. now, uh, some, somehow, to uh, help them lay, lay some more fiber and get their students hooked up. And uh, the progress has been great. They actually just released the new annual report today. Uh, maybe I can link to that in the show notes if people are interested. But, uh, yeah, it's, the, the progress is great, but there's still a lot of work to do. Yep. All right. Well, if you want to go listen to the talk, this will come out in two weeks. So the, the conference, I think, is the week after this comes out. So anyway, go sign up at rubydevsummit.com. Um, the tickets are free and it's going to be online. And then if you want like the recordings, I'm also going to throw in access to Ruby Rogues Parlay as part of the all access pass. So if you, if you kind of want the two for deal there, um, you can go get an all access pass as well. Just, you know, scroll down till you see the registration link and then sign up. But yeah, we've got some great speakers, including uh, Uncle Bob and um, Matt are both going to speak. So um, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be exciting. So anyway, uh, if people want to follow you, Devin, uh, I don't know, blog or Twitter or GitHub or anything like that, wh what are the best places to to go to there? Uh, Twitter is probably the best way to find me. I'm uh, Devin C. Estes, D-E-V-O-N-C-E-S-T-E-S -E -E on Twitter. Um, I also have, uh, I also write a bit on uh, my, my blog, that's devinestes.com. Um, 
And funny enough, I, I might actually be writing a book on this topic too. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to find out tomorrow. I have another call with the publisher I've been talking to tomorrow. And uh, if people want to sign up for a mailing list to get info on the book, if, if I write it, who knows, uh, they can uh, go to devonestas.com slash F-I-R. You can just put your email in there. And if I write the book, maybe I'll email you and tell you when it's out or send you some stuff. So, um, yeah, we'll see what's what happens with that. But uh, that's the best way to get in touch with me. Awesome. Well, let's do some picks. This episode is sponsored by Airbreak. I don't know about you, but week in and week out, I spend hours debugging my code when I could be working on building new stuff. Then I started using Airbrake.io, our latest sponsor, and the time I spent debugging was cut in half. Airbrake alerts you to errors in your software, then helps you diagnose and fix them. That means no more wasted time searching log files and more time writing and shipping great code. Airbrake supports .NET and all major programming languages. Sign up at getairbrake.com slash rogues for a free 30-day trial and the chance to win a $500 Amazon gift card at the end of the month. It's a completely free trial and you'll be shocked at how much time it saves you. Again, that's getairbreak.com slash rogues. Dave, do you want to start us off with picks? Yeah, I just have one pick. It's Amazon free time. So I have a bunch of little kids, and we got there on the Prime Day the Fire tablets. And Amazon free time is basically a service where it gives a kid um, free reign access to a set of safe apps and videos to watch to where I don't have to really monitor them when they have their uh, Kindle time. So it's been really great for us. It's been a saver to where we could just hand the kid the tablet and they can play around, install new games. That's all, you know, kind of been previously vetted or monitored for, you know, her age group. Now, it sounds like there are some uh, timing controls on that too. So can you set, they get so many hours per day or things like that? I think there are, but, <laughs> you know, honestly, lately, we just got to be given her free reign, and we'll manually control that when it's time. Yeah, my, I, the reason I ask is because my son's um, in a treatment program called Brain Balance, and they they tell us to limit his screen time to an hour outside of school, because obviously a lot of the homeschool stuff's on the internet. So, um, anyway, um, since we have to limit his time to an hour on weekdays and and two hours on the weekend, it'd be nice to just say, you can do whatever you want with this tablet until it kicks you off. Yeah. I'll have to check in on that. I know that uh, Apple products have the guided access mode, which mm-hmm. you can set a time limit, and then it'll just shut off the tablet after that amount of time. But mm. I don't know if something like that for Kindle exists. I'll have to look into it. Cool. Is that your only pick? I don't want to cut you off if you have something else. Yeah, no, I think that's it. Okay. Eric, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, I got a couple. So the first one is a gem that my buddy Nate wrote called Pipe Envy. And one night he says, dude, I'm I'm just going to do this because I want to do it. And he loves Elixir. He loves it. But the problem is, is that he, his whole world revolves around Ruby. So he's like, I wonder if I can do this. He wrote a gem that essentially takes the Elixir's pipe operator and applies it to Ruby. Um, it's kind of a fun thing that you can do. It's, uh, but, but he says right out of the gate, he's like, don't use this. It's not a good idea, but it can, you can do it. So uh, the gem is hopsoft slash pipe envy, pipe underscore envy. And then the other one is, uh, so I've been on the keto diet for six months now. I've lost 42 pounds. And uh, I've and every night, almost every night, I have a piece of cheesecake. And my beautiful wife, she makes me cheesecake every week. And uh, and so this cheesecake is completely sugar free. It's keto friendly. Um, I think it's like four carbs per piece. Anyway, uh, I'm I, I I'm a huge fan of this one. So I'm sharing the recipe. Um, you heard it here first. You can eat cheesecake and lose weight. <laughs> Those <Nice>. are my picks. <laughs> Very cool. I, I'll just throw in um, and uh, on the keto diet, and then I'll also talk about some stuff related to that. But I've been doing the keto diet as well. I've lost 20 pounds. 
Um, and more important, um, I think I've mentioned on the show several times that I am type two, type two diabetic. Um, and all of my diabetes, I've tried everything under the sun. I've been on every medication they make for diabetes. I was on insulin for a while. Um, keto diet fixed all that. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So uh, all of my markers went way, way down. The only thing that my doctor was concerned about was, uh, at my last visit was my cholesterol was high. And the more I look into cholesterol, the more I'm thinking that cholesterol is high is complete crap anyway. So um, anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a couple of picks. One is if you have been in the programming uh, arena for a while, you listen to other shows, you might have listened to .NET Rocks. Um, Carl Franklin is one of the guys on there. Um, he's been podcasting for a long, long, long time. And, uh, I, anyway, I met them, at, I met he and Richard who, who's his partner in crime on .NET rocks at a conference back in like 2012, 2013. And, um, incidentally, that's also where I met Jessica Kerr, who was a panelist on this show for a while. Um, anyway, um, he has another show about the keto diet and it's called two keto dudes. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, I think it's just two keto.com is the domain for that. But, um, anyway, it's, it's a fun show to listen to his co-host on that show is also named Richard, but it's not the same Richard and they share recipes and they talk about the science. Um, they, they're total nerds. So they, you know, they're both programmers and they, but they, they like, uh, they have errata to the show, <laughs> all this stuff. But uh, anyway, it's terrific. And they they really do just dive in. And you know what? We want to know how this works. We want to know what the science is. We want to know what this is all about. And it just kind of hits me at, at, at the way I think about this. And maybe it's because I have that in common with them. But anyway, it's a terrific show. Um, they also have a forum um, and just a lot of resources available for people doing the keto diet. So if you're interested in that, you can go pick that up. Um, another resource when I was getting started with a keto diet is a book by Jimmy Moore, who also has a podcast, incidentally, called The Live in La Vida Low Carb Show. But I found that I, I was only interested in one in every like 10 episodes he put out. And so I just kind of quit listening because I quit. I, I got tired of trying to pick through them, the ones that I wanted to hear. Um, but his book is terrific. It's called Keto Clarity. And they go into a lot of this stuff about the keto diet and the science behind it and how to do it and why to do it and all that stuff. So um, if you're interested in it, you can also pick up that book on Amazon. I actually listen to it on Audible. And so I'll put a link to um, Audible as well, just because that's how I consume a lot of media these days. Um, and then um, finally, just another reminder, go check out Ruby Dev Summit. Um, it's online. It's free if, if you want to just come and listen to the talks live. And uh, we have 20-something speakers that are coming to speak uh, over the course of a week. Uh, and on the last day, we're having Matt's and Uncle Bob and one or two other people speaking. But Devin's one of our speakers. A lot of other people who have been on the show before are also speaking. So definitely check it out. Dave's speaking too. So um, come hear his genius and Devin's genius and um, you know some of these other folks that you've heard of. Uh, Devin, what are your picks? Cool. So the first one is a Coursera course called From NAND to Tetris, Part 2. Um, I did NAND to Tetris Part 1 a while back. Um, and basically what, what this originally is, is it's a book called uh, Modern Computing from First Principles. But they do a really wonderful Coursera course. Uh, part 1 takes you from, you start with literally just the NAND gate. They give you that. And then you build up all of the other logic gates from that. And you build up all of the other parts of a computer from that. Um, and then eventually part one takes you all the way up through, uh, writing an assembler. Uh, so you write an assembler down a machine code that runs on the machine that you just built, uh, which is awesome. And then part two, um, basically gives you the second half of, of, uh, the computer. So from the assembler up, so you build a virtual machine, a compiler, an operating system, and uh, eventually you have written pretty much all of the code for a computer and everything that runs on that computer that uh, gives you essentially a, a Java-like language. Uh, and it's incredible that you can go through all of that in two seven-week courses. Uh, but I, the quality of the material is so, so high, and they do such a great job of teaching it. I, I cannot recommend that higher. Uh, cannot recommend that highly enough. Uh, I think it's a wonderful course, and for someone who doesn't have a computer science or electrical engineering degree, I've I've gotten a whole lot out of it. 
Um, my second pick is season four of BoJack Horseman. Uh, so my wife and I just finished it and it's, um, it's simultaneously like a brilliant and hilarious, but also really touching and wonderful, wonderfully done and very sad at times show. Um, but it, it affected me in ways that I didn't think it would. And that's sort of what I like out of entertainment sometimes is when something just really hits you in a way. So, uh, I had to pick that because it was, it, it was great. Um, you know, they go do everything from like the stupidest sight gags to like Philip Roth puns, uh, and yeah, it was just really, really well done. Uh, and I also want to pick zoos. So I've, I've gone to the zoo here in Berlin probably nine out of 10 weekends for the last year because my oldest son loves the zoo. And it never gets old. Zoos are pretty great, especially good zoos. If you have a zoo near you and you haven't gone to a zoo in a while, go check out some animals. We, we just got pandas here in Berlin in July. We have Germany's only pandas. Uh, but even stuff like this, this last Sunday, we were in the, uh, the nocturnal animal house and I saw one of those little bush babies and kind of like little tiny monkey looking things, but maybe six, six, eight inches tall. And it jumped like eight, eight feet high in the air onto a tree <laughs> and it like blew my mind, you know? So, uh, zoos are pretty great. Nature is pretty great. There are some cool animals out there and it's nice to see them up close. Uh, so that's it for me. Meerkats are my favorite. Meerkats have a great German name. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, well, yeah. What's the German name? German Erdmännchen, which are little little ground men. <laughs> like, like the, it's a great game. Directly translating some German words, uh, like a, a, a turtle is a shield so or a shield tortoise, uh, or a shield shield frog, which makes perfect sense. Uh, or some other good ones. So that an anteater is actually an ant bear, a meisen bear. Uh, yeah, but yeah, meerkats, uh, Erdmännchen is, is funny. Little, little earthmen, little ground men. Because uh, <laughs> they do kind of look like people in certain light. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, we will uh, wrap up this episode and we'll be back on next week. All right. Talk to you all later. Bye. Hey, take care. Nice Bye. meeting you, Devin. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.